This is Anna Adamek in Toronto. It's November 10, 2017. Could you give me your name and tell me where you were born? John Brzezinski, and I was born in Gagnon, Quebec. And could you talk about your childhood? What were your hobbies as a child? What were you like as a child? Uh, I, I am the uh, sixth of six children, uh, the, the youngest. Uh, my parents moved to Canada in 1964. Uh, just pr prior to where I was born, my father was a, uh, an electrical engineer. Uh, he fought in the Second World War. He, he was originally from Poland, left Poland during the war, ended up in, in England uh, subsequent to the war. Uh, he and my mother uh, married in the uh, mid-50s. They had my five brothers and sisters. He was working for uh, British Hydro at the time and then was uh, recruited to come over and, and work in Canada in one of the big iron ore mines in northern Canada. And so I was born actually in a mining town. Uh, I grew up in uh, New Brunswick. Which, uh, can you give me the place? Which uh, he, he worked for Quebec Cartier Steel, which was a, uh, a division of U.S. Steel uh, in uh, in Gagnon. Mm -hmm. Gagnon was a, a mining town built purpose uh, or purpose built town for the mine. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in charge of all the ball mills uh, and, and running the operations there. They they moved to New Brunswick uh, just after I was born. Uh, so, effectively, I grew up in, in Moncton and uh, went to the local high school and, and eventually went to Mount Allison University after I got out of high school. Uh, my hobbies as a, as a child were, were largely sports, uh, I don't know, all kinds of things. We uh, spent a lot of the, the weekends out on the Fundy Coast and, and the different places in New Brunswick. There's a lot of geology to see in New Brunswick, uh, lot, lots of exposed coastlines, so it was probably one of the reasons I gravitated to, to uh, geology. Mm -hmm. So did your parents encourage you to study science? Um, yeah, I was supposed to be a doctor. Science? I was supposed to be a doctor. My, uh, my father wanted to be a doctor. His, his dad was a doctor. My mother's father was a doctor. My mother was a, an x-ray technician during the war. Uh, we had a lot of uncles who were, were doctors and, and pe uh, medical people in the family. Uh, the reason my dad was an engineer was because he couldn't afford to go to medical school in, in, in England after the war. Uh, he was forced to leave home. and, and uh, uh, So he always wanted a doctor in the family. Uh, my uh, elder brothers and sisters were all biologists. I started with a biology pre-med degree and after the first year decided that I wanted to be a geologist instead, and uh, which my dad found out when I graduated. So was that when you became interested in geology and mining? It was my second, second year of university. Uh, I, I took a few geology courses and uh, it was something that interested me a lot more than, than uh, studying biology and it progressed from there. So Mount Allison, that's where you started your yes, education, yeah. your higher education. Why that university? Uh, initially because they had a football team. Uh, I, I played a lot of sports and uh, it was about an hour away from where I grew up. Uh, it, uh, sorry. Um, they had a, a, a good geology department, uh, I was to learn later, uh, but, but it was a combination between the sports and the, the pre-med program they had at the time. I could do a three-year degree as opposed to a four-year four degree. Uh, I, I had uh, quite good marks when I left high school, so it was a way of getting uh, out of university faster to go on with the, the, the medical uh, degree that was initially the plan, which I changed after my first year. That, that's really interesting, though. I'd like to explore it a little bit. Did sure. you feel like you were pushed into? You, you said that it was no, an not, expectation. No, not pushed and... into it, but it's uh -huh. uh, you know parental expectation. Uh, being the last of six and not having a doctor in the family yet, my my sister Susan became a veterinarian. My sister Anne Marie uh, was on the verge of, of uh, getting into medicine when she uh, uh, decided to get married instead. Uh, she married a, a geologist, uh, coincidentally a, a fellow who still teaches at Western. Um, and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was I was one who was supposed to be the doctor, uh, but uh, it, it wasn't as as if my my father was forcing me to be one. I just knew that that was uh, something he would have liked to have seen. But I, I think in perfect hindsight, he's quite happy with the career mm -hmm. path I chose. So you did go with your passion. Sure, that was yeah. your passion. Really. Uh, from there, Queen's University. So yeah. again, why Queen's? Uh, Queens was the second degree I took, and uh, the particular course I took was the, the Minex course. Uh, at the time, there were two universities in Canada that were offering the, uh, uh, it's an advanced mineral exploration and economics course, uh, Queens and McGill. Uh, but they don't take students uh, fresh out of their first degree. They, it, it's more of an industry course where 
Uh, the requirement at the time was you, you had to have been working for at least six or seven years before they would consider you. And the, the course was uh, largely funded by industry. So they were looking for people who were already working. They didn't have to get a lot of initial instruction on what exploration was about. Uh, the the Menex courses are looked at by a lot of the uh, companies that sponsor the, the courses as, as a way to uh, provide a, additional education to some of their, their staff who they think will be rising up the ladder in their companies. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the, the mineral economics portion isn't widely taught in a lot of universities. Mm -hmm. So to have somebody like Brian McKenzie teach you about why it is you're actually looking for the deposit uh, from a dollars and cents point of view was, was uh, uh, very revealing. You know, for, uh, and first time for a lot of exploration geologists to actually understand how a corporation looks at why they're spending money doing exploration for a certain commodity or in a certain country. Uh, or with certain parameters. So you mentioned uh, Professor McKenzie. Uh, who do you consider your mentors? Mentors? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose there have been a couple along the way. Dr. Uh, David Mossman w was my uh, thesis mm -hmm. supervisor at, at Mount Allison. He was the, the uh, fellow who was in charge of the economic geology course. And uh, he, he really got my interest going in uh, ore bodies or ore deposits. So th there are a lot of different directions you can take as a geologist. Uh, many end up as, as uh, on, on more of a scientific bent. Uh, I really like the idea of look, looking for uh, ore deposits, and, and he was certainly very, uh, very keen on, on teaching us about uh, different mineral exploration techniques and different, different mineral deposits around the world. Uh, at Queens, there was uh, Dr. Bob Mason, uh, who ran the Menex course. Uh, Jay Hodson, who eventually who ran the structural part of the course, who eventually went on to work with Barrick. Uh, and uh, uh, Brian McKenzie, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the math behind you know, what, what works as a good, good mineral deposit, what doesn't. Uh, from a pure work point of view, there was uh, a man named Bob Schaff, who I worked with uh, in my first job between the two degrees. Uh, he was a former longtime Anaconda employee uh, and eventually ran Kennecott uh, Canada as their president here in Canada. Uh, very old school. And you know how well, what type of pencil you use when you're doing a map, and how sharp the tip has to be, and uh, the military preciseness of your notes, and that type of thing. Economy of words when you're writing a report. Don't write a 50-page report if there's nothing to say. Make it two pages and move on. Uh, so uh, early on, as a I guess formative instruction as a geologist, uh, I'd list those people. Mm -hmm. And, and you mentioned that choice of industry versus academia. So can you talk a bit more about that? You chose your career in, in the industrial setting versus sure. academic yeah. research. Sure. It's, uh, I guess, more, more pragmatic and practical than anything. I mean, it's, uh, there's a lot of science be behind the study of geology. Uh, a lot of it I found very boring. I didn't really care about conodonts uh, or uh, you know, microfossils or, or uh, it, it, all, all these things play into some aspect of, of what you're looking at, uh, and I'm, I'm not trying to uh, make light of, of the different branches of, of, of the science. But you know, going out and, and finding an ore body is a little bit like treasure hunting. It's a different aspect of things. Uh, you, you have a, a definite starting point, a defi definite ending point. Uh, one coming up with an idea about what it is you're looking for, how you might find it, organizing the program, doing the program. Uh, successfully finding something and then determining whether you can make money by extracting it or not. Uh, it's a very methodical program to, to go through from start to finish. We were very lucky uh, at Osisco. We, we did exactly that. It, we, mm -hmm. we took it from concept to pouring gold bars. And uh, so you know, it's... it's uh, uh, we'll get to that. Yeah. But first, um, what was your first mining job? Uh, my first mining job was a summer uh, position working for an antimony uh, miner based out of New Brunswick uh, doing soil sampling. Basically walking around on a grid uh, taking soil samples and doing geophysics IP and, and mag work, walk, again walking around with equipment and, and taking readings. Do you remember your first day? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it was in uh, Nova Scotia, Hans County. Uh, the, the company was actually extracting antimony from a deposit in uh, St. George, New Brunswick, and they'd uh, uh, taken an option on a, a Nova Scotia deposit that we were exploring. And, uh, so I went down and uh, met up with the guys down there. It was pretty much what I expected. We had a, a, an extensive uh, 
amount of field experience when I was at Mount A because it's a, it's a school on the east coast. Uh, we did lots of mapping projects and, and saw lots of rocks and walked around a lot with, with backpacks and things. So it wasn't very very different from what I, I knew from uh, training at Mount A. Uh, the fellow I worked for was on the uh, Hemlo Discovery Team, which was kind of interesting because it was in the news a lot in the early 80s. And uh, so it was, the, and he had one of the first Apple computers, which we were using to enter the the, the daily field data data on. Uh, so it was all kind of interesting and new. Uh, you also work in quite challenging environments, South uh, America, Africa. Could you talk a bit about those jobs, those yeah. first prospecting jobs abroad? Sure, uh, and that, that was all subsequent to my, my graduation from Queens, uh, which is, is again one of the things that the MINEX program was very good for, was it, it more or less prepared you to look for uh, any type of deposit and in, in different global settings. You, you got to meet lots of people from other companies who had worked abroad. Um, I'd spent about eight or nine years working in Quebec and coming out with my master's degree I was ready for uh, a change mm -hmm. and so uh, it was uh, I guess the, the early 90s there, there, the industry was quiet at the time there weren't a lot of jobs around I put out a number of applications to different companies and one of the first ones I got back was to work in Central Africa on a diamond project and they told the people I had no experience in diamonds and they said well it's, it's, that's no problem it's like, like gravel deposits which pretty, company was this? A uh, company called United Reef. Uh, and uh, I was pretty sure it wasn't exactly like looking for gravel deposits, but I thought, okay, this is a, an entryway into Africa. So I took the job, told them I'd stay for a year, and I did. Uh, and that led to uh, my next eight or nine years of, of working in Africa. Uh, I more or less worked right across the whole central part of the continent. Mm -hmm. uh, went from the Central African Republic uh, to uh, another job in Ghana the next year, uh, and then to Burkina Faso. Mm -hmm. And then to Mali, and from Mali we were working in uh, Guinea, uh, Mauritania, uh, the Côte d'Ivoire, uh, and then eventually went over to Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And uh, from Tanzania, that, that was uh, pretty much the end of my African experience. And I came back to Canada in 2002. Uh, in Africa, you worked uh, on prospecting and exploration. Did you also work on uh, relations with communities? Was that part of your job? Yes, yeah, certainly was. I, I was. Uh, from, from the time I was working in Quebec, I, I was a, a project manager level geologist. Um, by the time I, I started working in Africa, I, I was running projects, uh, starting in the Central African Republic. Uh, by the time I left, I was the country manager in Tanzania, so it worked, worked across a lot of, of different uh, uh, levels on different projects with different uh, sizes of staffs, uh, for instance in, in Mali and, and Tanzania. Uh, we, we would have had somewhere between two and three hundred um, staff members. Uh, about uh, five percent of those would have been expats, and the rest would have been local geologists, government geologists, and, and uh, local labor force. Mm -hmm. So we, we dealt extensively with the communities and, and village chiefs and uh, different government levels, from the ministers right up to meeting presidents mm -hmm. uh, from time to time when we were looking for concessions. That mm -hmm. When did you come back to Canada? I uh, left uh, Tanzania in uh, 2002, uh, which was about the same time that my business partner Sean Rusin uh, was leaving uh, Niger, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's how we, we got started on Osisco. Was we we we'd both uh, uh, Sean had been there about 13 years, okay. and uh, their company had just signed a, a joint venture with Semafo, and so he'd come back and was looking for something new to do, and so was I. Mm -hmm. So creation of Osisco. You told me a bit how you met uh, Mr. Rosen, um, and you were joined by Robert uh, Juarez too. Eventually. How did you? Yes. So can you can you walk me through the creation yeah, of sure. Osisco? And it's Osisco exploration and then Osisco mining. It I was understand. Osisco exploration, uh, which we then uh, renamed Osisco Mining Corporation, uh, and then uh, that company was sold, and the, the current company is Osisco Mining. It, it, it started as a. I'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> Let's start with people. How Let's start with people and, and, and how, how we started the, the, the mm -hmm. company. Uh, when Sean left uh, Africa, uh, he met up with uh, a couple of, of people that he'd worked for uh, or worked with in, in Africa uh, back in the late 80s. Uh, it was Norman Storm uh, and his dad. And at the time, they were looking at oil and gas projects in Kazakhstan. And uh, working uh, with a very small group based out of Germany, Sean uh, 
knew that I, I was just leaving my job and so we, we went over to Germany, uh, met up with the guys and we started looking at uh, different projects in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Can I just uh, ask you, did you work in English or do you speak uh, several other I speak, languages? I speak French as well. You speak French? Yeah, it's uh, mm -hmm. from, from my time in Quebec and, and uh, my time in, in Africa, most of my time was spent in French, what were French West African uh, colonies. Because you, so, you mentioned moving through those different countries, there yes. is German that comes in, there is Russian that comes in. Yeah, I, un unfortunately, you know, my dad speaks uh, English, French, Russian, Polish, German. Mm -hmm. uh, that I grew up as an Anglophone. Uh, that I learned my French uh, in Quebec and, and in, in West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, I, uh, although it would have been very useful for me to speak Russian and, and German uh, along the way, it's uh, uh, I, I more or less just listen to other people speak it. So let's go back to Kazakhstan then. Yeah. So we we uh, we, we started uh, really with a, with a private fund based out of Europe uh, called Eurasia, uh, Eurasia Holding, uh, that we set up to do the work in Kazakhstan. And the initial idea was in in early 2002, uh, 2002, 2003. There, there really wasn't a mining business to be had. It was it was quiet on all fronts. Uh, there wasn't much investment going into gold companies or copper companies or, or any mining companies. Uh, we looked at uh, oil and gas businesses being not so different from mining. Uh, Sean had a lot of experience in drilling and I obviously had a lot of experience as a geologist. So we thought, okay, it's geology and drilling. Uh, we'll go figure it out. So we raised some money as a group and started acquiring some, some oil and gas projects in Kazakhstan. Uh, then in early 2003, the price of gold uh, started to move a little bit. Uh, I was uh, offered a, a project uh, that I'd, I'd worked on historically uh, in Quebec. It was one that, that Bob Wears also knew. My, my first encounter with Bob Wears was back in 1985 uh, on one of my, my first jobs uh, leaving Mount Allison. So I knew who he was. And, and Quebec's a small place and most of the geologists know each other. So when we came back to Canada to start looking at gold projects, uh, we got together with Bob Wears. Mm -hmm. And uh, he coincidentally had uh, the, the Shell Osisco exploration, which he uh, had uh, acquired from Andre Goma. Uh, Andre was a, a very well known geologist at the time who ran Virginia, uh, had had some success in, in discovering a, a couple of deposits, including Eleanor. Uh, so Bob acquired the shell for him. It, was a, it, it had a number of, of insignificant properties in it. Uh, Sean and I approached him with the idea of using money from the fund that we just set up in, in Europe uh, to finance going to look for gold deposits in Canada and Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we had a very specific concept that we wanted to apply. Uh, I'd just spent uh, eight or nine years in Africa and Sean uh, the previous 13 and, and largely what we were doing in Africa was, was as the countries were opening up uh, in the 90s, uh, they, they were uh, more or less forced, many of them, to change their mining acts uh, to allow majority foreign ownership. This was af after the collapse of, of the Soviet Union, uh, who used to sponsor a lot of those, those countries. So in order to get the uh, uh, new funding uh, from, from the World Bank and, and, uh, and IMF, uh, they had to change the, their mining uh, codes to allow new companies to come in and do exploration, and many, many were successful in finding new deposits. Uh, but in a lot of cases, what the companies did was they were really just going back to old colonial deposits uh, that, that hadn't been accessed since a lot of these countries had gone independent in the 60s. And finding old mines where high grade had been mined out and they, they left the lower grade material and the hanging walls and the foot walls. And so in the 90s, a lot of companies just went in there, redrilled these deposits and came up with multi-million ounce deposits that were lower grade. Uh, but because they were oxide, they were easy to mine, uh, inexpensive to mine and, and very profitable. So there was a whole wave uh, of new exploration and, and discovery and rediscovery in Africa at that point. Uh, not different to, I guess, some of the placer gold rushes uh, in the late 1800s. Uh, but it was a one-time event because once you go and find those oxide deposits and mine them out, then they're gone. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we weren't trying to apply that concept to Canada, uh, but it did occur to us that there were lots of old mining camps in Canada. Uh, where they'd mined out the high grade, and there were probably some big low grade deposits sitting around in Canada uh, in hard rock. So when we got together, uh, Sean and I, uh, with Bob, the idea was to go uh, and look at these old camps, try find big bulk tonnage, low grade deposits, 
uh, in hard rock that, that we could possibly mine. There there'd been a number of significant changes uh, engineering wise in, in terms of the size of trucks, uh, the size of, of mills, sag mills uh, particularly, uh, you know, 38 foot sag mills, 41 foot sag mills. So we were looking at it from a unit cost point of view. If you could find something with enough tons, you could work with a lower grade. And most Canadians, uh, most Canadians in the mining business at the time weren't looking at low grade deposits because everybody knew you needed at least seven grams to have a mine that was viable. And so when we started the company, uh, we started looking at some of these old camps. One of the first things that Bob Wears did was he wrote a, a small algorithm uh, to run through the Quebec digital database, which was one of the most advanced at the time. Uh, it was a pretty simple algorithm. If, if the length of a piece of drill core is X to Y and the grade is A to B, give me a list. And he developed the list, which we then systematically started going through. And by the time we got to the third one, uh, that was the Canadian Malarctic deposit. It had just come up in a bankruptcy sale. Mm -hmm. And we successfully bid it for about $80,000. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, not, not being certain that it, that it was what we wanted, but once we got it, we went up and we looked at the drill core and we realized that, that at the same time it was also a porphyry deposit. Uh, Bob had had a lot of experience in porphyries at, at places like uh, uh, Murdochville uh, with Naranda. He, he relogged all of the uh, gas bay copper core. And uh, so as far as people that we knew that knew porphyries, Bob knew what a porphyry was. And, and we were very surprised to see that what a lot of people had considered to be a, a typical abitibi deposit was anything but. Mm -hmm. And so we knew we had something special from the beginning. Uh, but the biggest problem we had was there was a town sitting on it. Mm -hmm. And so again, it was an asset that, that, that people hadn't considered to be viable. Uh, it was one, even if they had thought it was viable, they, they, they didn't want because of the complex issue of how do you move a town off the deposit? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I guess because we didn't know better at the time, uh, we, we, we had we set no limitations on what we thought we could do, uh, which is probably the reason that, that we achieved successfully mm -hmm. putting the mine into production. Uh, it was a huge undertaking for a company that uh, really was, was just a shell when we started. Did you work with um, sociologists, uh, urban planners, or was it mostly mining people? I kind of made it up as we went along. Uh -huh. uh, again, you can imagine the three of us sitting around, having gone through the first couple deposits on our list, we'd probably spent two or three million dollars of our group's money at that point, and they were anxious for us to find something. Everybody always assumes you're going to go find a, an ore body right away. Uh, we came upon Malartic, and you know, it took, us, it took us a while to really figure out how big it, it really was. Uh, when, when we acquired the property, uh, there's a neat story, Bob got a phone call from the bankruptcy trustee saying, you know, what do you want me to do with the data? And Bob just offhandedly said, well, just send it down to my office in Montreal. And the guy kind of said, are you, are you sure? He said, yep. And a couple of days later, a transport truck showed up with 30 years of, of mining data, all the daily production records, it was something like 40,000 files in boxes and, and filing cabinets showed up. And it was lucky that, that Bob's office at the time was an old uh, uh, kind of a, a unit warehouse type thing that had a little office up at the front. So we managed to store all, all of the boxes and things uh, in the back. Uh, we ended up hiring a bunch of unemployed geologists to digitize mm -hmm. uh, the four or five or six thousand drill logs that we had at the time. There, there were many more. It, it took months and months and months to digitize all, all of these paper files that went back to the 1930s. We had to do a lot of conversions from penny weights to, uh, to grams per ton. Uh, and eventually a model started to emerge of, of what looked like a very big cohesive deposit. There were gaps in the information where, where there weren't any existing drill holes, and that's what we designed as a first program. Uh, we really wanted to know if we were going to spend time on this or not, so we, we designed a longitudinal drill section across about a kilometer and a half of the deposit vertical holes down to 400 meters. And if they came back with, with gold in them, then we knew that the game was on. And pretty much all of them came back better than we'd, we'd hoped. So you know, we, we knew we had a big deposit. But then back to your question, you know, did we engage sociologists and people? At that point, we knew if we were going to be successful in this, we had to move the town. Uh, we, we weren't a big company by any means at that point. Uh, but uh, you know, we, we were very familiar with, with the, the, the people uh, or, 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 or I guess the uh, the way that the people in the small towns would think we'd all either grown up in small towns or worked in small towns in, in Quebec in, in the course of our careers. Uh, so we took the simple approach. We just went door to door mm -hmm. and we met with all the people mm -hmm. in the southern neighborhood and said, well, look, 
we've just done a bunch of holes here that tell us that there might be something here, and before we spend any more money, we really need to know that if there is a mine, are you, are you people interested in, in, in moving or relocating? And we got a very positive response uh, from, from the people in the town. So we went back to our group in Germany and asked them for more money, and that's how we started the program. Mm -hmm. So actually, th this is something I wanted to ask you about, because you are starting it around the time that there is an economic crisis in the U.S. especially, that, that but came, I'm sure... That came, yeah. Yes, so how did you secure funding? Well, when we, when we started again, it was, it was uh, the initial money came from our group in Europe. Uh, Eurasia, I think at the beginning, owned something uh, over 50% of, of Osisco exploration. And the initial drilling we did was in, uh, in the spring of 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we continued our drilling. Uh, we, did, we put out our first resource, I think, in 2006. Um, and proved that we, we had a sizable deposit. I think that initial resource was about four, four and a half million ounces or 4.3 million ounces. Uh, from that point, we uh, started marketing in, in places like Toronto and New York, and, and our shareholder base grew. We, we hired the engineering team from uh, Cambior, uh, who had just been acquired by uh, IM Gold. Uh, but we were, we were lucky enough to get the top engineers in the process of that sale to come and work with us. Uh, we were successful in raising more money. Uh, we raised another $150 million, I think, in, uh, in October of 2007. Mm -hmm. So when the financial crisis hit in 2008, uh, we had an advanced deposit. Uh, we were working towards feasibility. Uh, we'd increased the size of the deposit to uh, something over 8 million ounces. Uh, but when the feasibility came out in the fall of 2008, just in time for the financial crisis, uh, it was telling the market that we now needed to go find a billion dollars mm -hmm. to, to build the mine. And there probably wasn't a billion dollars in, in all of Canada at that point in, in terms of liquid cash. Uh, so, of course, our share price crashed down. And, uh, but fortunately, we had we'd raised that $150 million the previous October. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just it was a rare window that opened up on Halloween Day. It was open and shut before the day was over. Uh, but we managed to do a, do a significant financing. And at one point uh, during the financial crisis, we were trading pretty much at the cash value uh, of what we had in the bank. Mm -hmm. And our eight million ounce deposit was being discounted to zero. Mm -hmm. So you know, we, our thinking at the time was that if anybody was going to try and and steal the the company from us, that would have been the time. But every other company mm -hmm. in the business was having facing its own problems at the time. Uh, so we we were lucky to, uh, I, I guess that there there weren't uh, you know everyone else was preoccupied with their own own issues at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there were lots of covenants on on debt notes and things that that were being tripped or almost being tripped that, that people were more concerned with. So uh, there there wasn't a lot of focus from the seniors on on trying to go out and do M&A. Mm -hmm. uh, in early 2009, uh, just about three or four months after the the peak of the crisis. Uh, our share price had rebounded back to about five and a half dollars, and again, a financing window appeared. And we decided at that point to vote for about a $250 million financing. Uh, within about the first 15 minutes, we had uh, three or four times the demand. We upsized the deal. Eventually, uh, we, we, we took in $403 million directly and another $120 million or $220 million with a short-term warrant that we had attached. So the, the financing we did that day in February, uh, just literally within three months of the financial crisis, amounted to about $643 million. Over the balance of 2009, uh, we completed a total of uh, $1 billion, $50 million of financing. And you know, suddenly we were one of the only companies out there that was fully financed to build the mine. We did it almost entirely with equity. Uh, there, there was a small piece of debt with the Canada Pension Plan, or CPPIB. Uh, and uh, 20 million dollars with the FTSQ, one of the Quebec pension funds, uh, but it, the rest of it was entirely done in equity. And no junior mining company had ever done that before. Mm -hmm. you know, here, here it was. We, we had all the money to build our mine. Uh, the uh, the town move had, had started about that time, and, uh, and we were ready just to, to go and start building. Mm -hmm. Just to go back to those early days, early 2000. Did you find that BRIACS had any effect on what you were trying to do? Was the discussion still going on or was that over? By the yeah, time? no, not really. I mean, you know, BRIACS, uh, I was working in Africa when, when BRIACS happened and uh, a lot of people, 
everybody in our business is watching what was happening with, with great interest. I, I know a lot of the people that were involved uh, in the story, not, not in, obviously in the scandal, uh, but uh, some of the people who were on the ground as consultants, some of the people that were working for Freeport. Uh, I know some investors that went over and, and saw the project, that type of thing. So I've, I've had lots of background on the story over the years. Um, yeah, really, I think the only thing that changed was was the implementation of things like 43101. There, there was a lot of loose reporting at the time. Mm -hmm. I remember just prior to the Brayek scandal happening, somebody putting out a, a press release estimating a resource based on a soil geochemistry anomaly in Ghana, mm -hmm. which was really getting to the far reaches of, of insanity in terms of, of what, what people were trying to get away with at the time. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's made uh, certainly the, the technical standard of reporting uh, a lot more responsible. Uh, in one sense, it's kind of shifted the, uh, the potential focus of any blame onto the geologists, mm -hmm. uh, which I'm not certain is, is entirely fair. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly it, it, it's, it's made it a lot tougher for people to, to perpetrate, perpetrate uh, uh, you know, direct frauds. Uh, in terms of, of how it affected the business in, in, in early 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, uh, just as we were getting going, really the business works in cycles. So that you know that happened at the end of the previous mining cycle and it was time for the next cycle to come on. So I, I don't think it had a direct effect on, on what was happening in the early 2000s. Okay, so the mine is established, the uh, community is moved. Yeah. You observe that change in the community. Could you talk a, about that employment that changed? Uh, how many? How when, many people? When we showed up, community? when we showed up in Malartic in uh, in the fall of 2004, uh, about the time that we were making the acquisition and just afterwards, uh, the town had something like 40, 45 percent unemployment. Uh, they were slowly selling off their municipal assets, like the golf course and, and the hockey rink and things, to to pay for the uh, winter snow removal and. Uh, the towns weren't allowed to run a deficit budget, but because there, a lot of the main industry had shut down, the Domter uh, sawmill had shut down in town. Mm -hmm. uh, the last mine had closed a couple of years before. Uh, the grocery store had burnt down. Uh, the part of the town that we were hoping to move was called uh, Petit Beirut, Beirut you know, Little Beirut. Uh, so the, the town was really in a tough position. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know when we put out the press release announcing that we had acquired the project, it, it took about 15 minutes for the mayor to call us and welcome us to come up and, and start work up there. Uh, so generally we had a very good reception from the town. Uh, and again, when, when we realized that we would have to move a significant portion of the town, the, the, the response was very good. Uh, there, there were obviously some people who, who were concerned. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, really, it, it, you know, in, in the whole, it, it, it went very smoothly. We, we actually committed to moving that portion of the town before we had our own feasibility study in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we knew at the time that if we started to move homes in order to facilitate our work, um, that you know we, we couldn't move a third of the town and then run out of money and not. So we, what we did was mm -hmm. we guaranteed the town that if, if, if uh, they were in agreement, that we would move that portion of the town entirely and guarantee to do it. Uh, whether there was a mine or not. Uh, one of the issues facing parts of, of uh, that part of town were that the old underground workings came up in places to 10 meters from surface. Uh, there was a woman who came to see us uh, one day and said, you know, what are you, what are you guys doing near my house? I can hear rocks falling. And we said, well, we're not actually doing any work over there right now, but we'll send a drill over and see what, what's happening. And a little while later, somebody went out and the, and the drillers were all standing around and he said, well, what, what, what's going on? And they said, well, we, we drilled underneath our carport with one of the drills, and after 10 meters, it broke through into a 100-meter void. And so that was the first house that we bought and, uh, and, and moved that house off. Uh, but, but there were a number of houses. There were, there were actually streets that had fences across the street saying, you know, danger of cave-in, mm -hmm. you know, like at the intersections and things where, where, where they'd uh, subsequently gone and put up uh, a tall 10-foot uh, chain-link fences to stop people from driving on the, on the ground. So the issue a lot of the homeowners down there faced was that they couldn't sell their homes if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So there, it, it wasn't as if we you know, came in and, and were trying to force people off their land. This was a part of town where they never should have allowed homes to be built. Uh, because as the mines progressed over the years from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s, people had a tendency to like to live near the head frame. It wasn't as far to have to walk in the winter time and, and you know, that type of thing. And, and uh, rules and regulations weren't what they were today in terms of where you can build. 
but the net effect was in the 80s and 90s uh, and early 2000s, if people had wanted to move, they, they couldn't have because there would, there would be no legal way that they could sell those homes to somebody else. And saying, well, you know, I'm, yeah, sure, you can buy my house, but there's a giant hole underneath it. Mm -hmm. you know, it effectively puts the value of your land to zero. So what a lot of people were doing was just th throwing the keys on the porch and letting the bank banks take the homes and, and moving on. Uh, so we, we gave people an opportunity to move to an area that, that didn't have mine workings underneath it. Uh, or to purchase their homes outright. Mm -hmm. um, it was a very intricate and, and detailed plan in, in terms of how we, we wanted to treat uh, that part of our project. And it literally was a separate project. Uh, we wanted to make sure that if we were going to move you know, 100 or 200 or 300 homes, uh, obviously uh, some of the people wanted to move away. But if we were then just to go, uh, and I think the, the ratio was about half and half, half decided to sell and half wanted to move. Uh, but it didn't mean that we could only move now out of the 300, 150 homes. We had to either move 150 and rebuild another 150, or, but we wanted to make sure it was a net, uh, net sum uh, balance or, or positive for the town. So in the cases where people sold their homes and moved, we still moved the homes if we were able to. And if we couldn't move the home, we had to demolish it, we would rebuild a new home. Uh, you see, because if we'd have done anything less than that, it would have been removing homes from the tax base, mm -hmm. which meant that the tax burden would have been on those remaining people in the town. And so it, we wanted to make sure that everything that we did had no negative effect. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it had to be at least neutral, uh, but hopefully positive everything that we did. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we uh, chose the area for the new subdivision, it was where the golf course was. It was the best place to put it, uh, and we needed two of the holes. So we re rebuilt two new halls of the, of the golf course as well, and uh, and so on and so on. So it was we were we were very very conscious of, of being uh, you know, the the best possible corporate citizens uh, in, in terms of, of how we handled that move, uh, because we knew that you know, th this was a town where we were going to be operating you know, through the course of, of the history of our company and, and and the life of that mine, and we wanted to make sure that our, you know we, we had the best possible relationship with the town. Mm -hmm. Um, it already emerges in your answers, but could you talk about the culture at Osisco? Innovation culture, corporate culture, how would you define it? Yeah. Um, we weren't following anybody's book. Uh, we, we weren't trying to emulate anybody. We, we were always just trying to do things uh, in, in the best possible way. Uh, really, really, the company and the group has, has worked from uh, I guess my best way to put it is with a, uh, uh, a horizontal man management structure. We, we have different positions in the company, you know, presidents and vice presidents and, and so on and so on, but, but really what we do is we sit around as a group and decide how we're going to do things. And uh, you know, everybody has input on things and if, if we have somebody who objects strongly to something then, then we'll find a different way to do it. Uh, it's uh, it's been a very good way to work uh, from a group sense because we're we're using everybody's experience uh, to the maximum that way. You know, there, there are no rash decisions where somebody says, "Well, I'm in charge of this, so I'm just doing it that way." It was all all well considered and, and all agreed to. Mm -hmm. so. 2014, yeah. Gold Corp uh, tries to take yeah. over Asisco. Could you give me your thoughts on that? That event. Well, it was only the second time that Sean's called me at six in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, the first time was when we had a mill at the fire, mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, a fire at the mill, and uh, I got a call just shortly after six in the morning. And Sean's not an early riser, so I knew something was wrong. And the second time I got the call, I thought, okay, well, it can't be the mill again. Uh, but uh, he, he called me to say he just got off the phone with Chuck Janess, uh, who told him they were launching a bid for uh, for Cisco. Uh, it was a long, hard fight. Um, you know, we weren't surprised that somebody had decided to make a hostile attempt for the company. Uh, we, we knew that the Canadian Malarctic Mine would, would be a, a big uh, cash spinner for a long time. It was the large, now the new, newest, largest mine in Canada. And uh, after, I guess, five months of, of uh, bitter fighting, uh, they backed away and, and the, the deal went through with Agni and Yamana. Uh, the, the way that the, the rules work in Canada, we, we couldn't stop the sale of the company. Uh, there is no just say no defense in Canada. And typically what happens the minute that somebody launches a hostile attack, uh, 20 or 30 or, or more percent of your company ends up in the hands of the arbitrage traders out of New York. 
uh, who then just try to engineer a higher sale. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, we, we knew that we'd be forced into a sale at one point, but when, when Goldcourt gave up and, and you know, finally we, we'd, we'd effectively won the battle, but lost the company. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, a, it was a, a bitter victory. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the initial bid had been 2.6 billion, uh, the final sale was about 4.3 billion, so we, we did the best that we could for our shareholders, but it wasn't a result that we were hoping for. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Osisco Royalties grew out of this Osisco process. Royalties grew out of the sale uh, to, to avoid a, uh, a double vote for uh, what were the White Knight suitors, Agnico and Yamana. Uh, we had to extract enough value from the deal which ended up being the Stubco, uh, Osisco Royalties, uh, with a valuation of about 500 million. And so we started business the next day, now as a royalty company. Uh, a number of things besides the 5% the, the NSR for Canadian Malarctic, and 2% and on the other properties we had, we took out about 157 million in cash, some tax pools, uh, an equity portfolio that we had, which was very important subsequently, um, and some properties. Uh, and then we had to decide very quickly, are we going to really be a royalty company or are we going to be uh, a mining company? Uh, we were lucky in that we kept uh, a lot of the top people in the company, uh, top engineers, top resource geologists, top uh, explorers, that type of thing. So we were able to quickly rebuild uh, while we were separating out royalty company from other assets. Uh, we took some of the members of the teams and put them into things like Nile Gold, Bob Wares, Mm -hmm. uh, who started the company with Sean and I uh, took over that project, Marban, which was a satellite deposit of the Canadian market. Spent the next year and a half drilling that off to a, to a new resource. Mm -hmm. uh, Luke and his teams uh, ended up in Falco, uh, which was basically an engineering project, go and design the, the, the Horn 5 uh, mine. Uh, and some went to Oban and so on and so on. After uh, the first year in 2015, uh, we decided to use Oban as a platform for new Osisco mining mm -hmm. and then draw all those people back in. The, the issue we had was, as a royalty company, you, you can't have a large staff. You can, but it, 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 you, you become a, an abnormal royalty company. Typically, a royalty company will have a staff of about a dozen. We had about 93. Mm -hmm. So in, in order to uh, not look like we had this giant GNA, uh, we, we put those people into the other companies mm -hmm. and came up with what we called the... Uh, I guess the, the accelerator model, where, where with our own companies they would trade a royalty or sell a royalty to uh, Osisco Royalties in return for the cash, which then allowed them to go out and, and do exploration and develop deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, so, taking Oban, which had uh, 10 million of cash and an $8 million market cap in the summer of 2015, uh, again, it was a down cycle, much like 2003 when people didn't care about mining, like we'd started. Uh, the original Cisco. Uh, we, we employed the same techniques and philosophy that we did when we started Cisco One. We were looking to consolidate mining camps, mm -hmm. uh, it, but this time instead of just choosing one, initially it was the Malarctic camp for Cisco Version One. Uh, with Cisco Version Two, we were focused on the Malarctic camp, on the uh, uh, Windfall camp, uh, on the Garrison camp, on, on an area around Kirkland. So there, there, there were four, four or five areas that we were hoping to take a nucleus property in and then do, do the claim acquisition around. Mm -hmm. uh, what we've done in Malarctic was we bought the first property from bankruptcy and then and we spent the next year mm -hmm. consolidating that whole camp, knowing that if we were successful with the open pit model, we'd need all that ground. Uh, our assumption with the second company was that we probably weren't going to find another Canadian Malarctic, mm -hmm. but that we would find, you know, ideally two or three or four deposits that in aggregate would end up with the same half a million ounce a year plus or minus production. Uh, profile that we had with, with Osisco One. The, the idea was to rebuild the company, we were just forced to sell. Uh, we were very lucky with the acquisition of the windfall deposit mm -hmm. uh, in that it very quickly turned out to look like something very different again. Like Canadian Malarctic, uh, people had thought that that was a, a, a fault uh, related sheer posted coal deposit. Uh, what we showed people in the course of our work was that it was an Archean gold only porphyry. Uh, they, they weren't supposed to exist. There, there was no liter there was no pre-existing literature to uh, to mm -hmm. our work, and, and so you know that old adage you, you you'll never find what you're not looking for uh, was very appropriate. Um, 
Uh, it's, it's widely recognized as an Archean porphyry deposit. We think it puts to bed a lot of the argument between the two schools of thought in Canada that many people over the years have thought that things were all structurally structurally related to these big breaks. And then you have the older school who, you know, the where are the where's the granite guys? You know, they had to be an intrusive that, that was responsible for it. And, and the, the actual Canadian malarctic porphyry is cut by the Cadillac Larger Lake break. So geologically it's very simple to say the porphyry was there first. It brought gold into the system. Some of these other deposits are obviously re remobilization and reworking of that gold that was brought in by the, by the intrusives. What we found with windfall, uh, again, it was supposed to be, or, or was widely believed to be, uh, a typical Abitibi quartz vein fault related deposit. Uh, and it's not, it, it's a porphyry hosted uh, sulfide gold system. Uh, it is related to a fault, but it's not located in the fault. So, uh, again, a double adage or a double uh, 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 metaphor here. One, you, you're not going to find what you're not looking for, something you're not looking for because it was a porphyry deposit and they weren't looking for porphyries. Uh, it's also not where it's supposed to be. Uh, a lot of the exploration historically in, in, uh, in northern Canada has been focused on these main, main breaks. And people knew that if they were too far away from the major faults, they're wasting their money, so they typically wouldn't spend a lot of time exploring away from the faults. Mm -hmm. uh, when the windfall system is actually between two fault systems. So it, it, it's in an area where people wouldn't have, have looked for it typically. Mm -hmm. um, and now what, what we found is, is we have an extensive uh, porphyry system. So far it's over three kilometers long. Uh, it's all interrelated to one phase of, of a porphyry system, which we've defined. We've been drilling based on the porphyry model for over a year with, with almost 100% success with the drilling. So uh, if you look back in the last 14 years, we, we've defined two new styles of mineralization in the Abitibi as a company. Uh, we had one world-class deposit with uh, Canadian Malarctic and, and we're hoping that Windfall turns out to be our, our second world-class deposit. You have a number of awards. Uh, you were a <laughs> number of awards. <laughs> You were a, a prospector, CEO yeah. of company. Yeah. Um, is there one contribution or a set of contributions that you are the most proud of? Yeah, yeah I, I think we're probably one of the only groups, uh, certainly one of a, a very small handful, who are trying to recreate a company uh, in Canada. Over the course of my career, since I graduated in 1986 from Mount Allison, uh, I've seen the demise of companies that, that you would have thought would have been around forever, uh, like Naranda, uh, Falcon Bridge, Cominco, uh, Inco, uh, all of the, these great long-term huge Canadian corporations just disappearing in a bad market uh, you know, for, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, our goal when we started was to actually go out and start a mining company and produce gold. Uh, it, it, it goes back to the, the, the fundamental uh, foundation investors that we had in our group. Um, a lot of the money came out of Germany and from small German families who have a long history of running mm -hmm. small companies for generations in their family. And when a lot of the initial investors wrote, wrote their checks, they said, okay, well, here's my check, call me in five years or seven years when you're pouring gold. And that was pretty much the extent of it. They, they fully expected that we were going to go out and find a mine and, and go into production. Uh, typically, in our Canadian mining business, probably 95% or better of the companies have no intention of ever being miners. Uh, but we, we were genuine from the beginning about wanting to go out and, and find gold and produce gold. Uh, which goes back to why, why when we were forced to sell a Cisco One back in 2014, it was, it was a bitter defeat. Mm -hmm. Because we knew that we had that essential ingredient to create a big company uh, is a cornerstone world-class asset. Uh, every company, that every big company has one. With Barrick, it's Gold Strike. With Agnico, it was Laurent, uh, and so on and so on. And Canadian Malarctic was going to be our cornerstone asset. Uh, now again, we hopefully have that asset in Windfall, and the, the intent is still to go out and, and recreate a Canadian mining company. So that's, it, we, we, we've been quite successful in terms of, of creating value uh, for the shareholders over the years. The, the first company was taken from a million dollar market cap to, to a four billion dollar sale, which we literally returned to our shareholders. Mm -hmm. Uh, in three short years, the, the sum of the parts of our group uh, are now worth about five billion. So we're actually bigger now, mm -hmm. after three years of reconstruction, than we were after 11 years of initial work. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we've created about a, a total of nine billion dollars from three guys who started back in 2003 with with an idea. 
and you know we're, we're having a lot of fun doing it. We defined two new types of, of uh, deposits in the Archean, uh, which, which are now exploration models around the world for different companies. Uh, we, we saw a lot of companies follow on our success. Uh, bulk tonnage, low-grade mining uh, in, in other parts of Canada and other parts of the world using our same model. Uh, I suspect other people will now go out and start looking for windfall-style deposits in other parts of, of the uh, Archean in Canada and around the world. Uh, so quite proud of that. Um, you know, it, it's a business about making money for your shareholders. We've certainly done that. Mm -hmm. uh, winning the awards and things are, are nice, but it's you know we, we didn't go out setting out trying to, to win awards. Uh, it was really to, to build a fundamental company. And, and uh, you know, the, the, at this point, it, it's a, a it feels a little bit like nation building. Mm -hmm. uh, what are your thoughts on the culture of innovation in Canadian mining industry today? <sighs> yeah, um, uh, our business w was largely gutted uh, from sort of the mid mid eighties on. There, there, it, as mining, and it, it's a famous quote by, and I think it was Trudeau. Uh, or, or certainly one of his cabinet ministers, mining is a sunset industry. Uh, you know, to, to, for, to have a government a, a take a philosophical decision at one point in, and decide that it's no longer an important industry for your country uh, you know, shows you politically how they think about, about the business. Uh, very untrue, everything is made from one form of metal or another or, or, or something that's mined. Um, you know, the, the, what happened as a result of a lot of that were a lot of people started not taking mining courses. There were a lot of universities shut down down, down, down their programs. Uh, it happens in down cycles regardless, uh, but the funding went away for a lot of things like the GSC and, and the provincial uh, geology groups. Uh, so a, a net result of that is that in our business today you have a lot of people who are 26 and a lot of people who are 56. And there's a gap of, of uh, geologists, there's a gap of engineers, there's there, there a gap of uh, corporate leaders for companies who, who are actually have the experience necessary to run good fundamental mining companies. Uh, so what we're seeing is a lot of people coming into Canada, and, and, and I think we're, we're going to need a lot more for a while in countries like South well, or, or continents like South America or Africa, where the, where the Canadian money was being spent. Mm -hmm in the late 80s and through the 90s and early 2000s where people were actually getting the benefit of, of that, that knowledge. Uh, you know, otherwise, we're, we're going to have to see a large uptick in funding to Canadian universities and programs to create the next generation of, of geologists and engineers and, and corporate leaders to run mining companies because I don't think mining is ever going to go away from Canada. Uh, I think, if anything, one of the things that we've proven as OSISCO is that Canada still has a lot of mining potential. Uh, you, you just have to look at the problem differently. And, and as metal prices go up, uh, lower grades become more viable, changes in technology allow for, for different mining methods, uh, and again, make, make some things that in the past might have been viewed as being uneconomic, economic. Um, really, uh, I think we've only scratched the surface in terms of, of uh, the potential for finding new mines in the country. Uh, one, of the, one of the numbers I like the most is in the last cycle there were 52 million ounces of gold between Quebec and Ontario discovered that are in production now. Mm -hmm. And this is after everybody left in, in the 90s saying, well, there's, you know, there are no more mines in Canada, we don't need to be here anymore. Uh, you know, we're talking huge companies like Barrick and, and, and everybody else. They, they effectively left Canada because they, they thought there was a lack of potential. Mm -hmm. And now what we're seeing is a flood of all of these senior and intermediate miners coming back to Canada. Uh, companies like uh, Barrick, who haven't spent an exploration dollar in Canada in 20 years, so we, we have them as a partner now on our CAN project. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen uh, companies like El Dorado and Alamos, who formerly were working in places like Turkey and Greece, mm -hmm. coming back to Canada because of geo geopolitical problems overseas. Mm -hmm. uh, Canada's a really great place to go do exploration. You don't need a visa to go to Manitoba or to northern Quebec. Uh, you don't have to pay expat salaries in U.S. dollars. And you don't have to have rotational staffs. Uh, it's uh, and, and there's huge potential. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the, fr the future is, is very bright for uh, Canadian exploration, but it, it takes uh, that, that entrepreneurial thinking uh, and thinking outside the box, breaking down paradigm, and not, not looking for what everyone looked for for the first hundred years of Canadian mining history. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly, what's your advice to someone who wants to enter that industry, young uh, students? They don't have any preconceived notions about what it's about. Um, you know, the, the one thing that we very successfully did as a company was ignored all the rules. 
in, in terms of thinking what we were supposed to be looking for or, or what scale of mine that we could conceive of, of building. Uh, you know, raising a billion dollars, three guys who nobody knows in the company that nobody knows how to spell. You know, people were confusing us for a Japanese sushi restaurant at the beginning of Cisco. Uh, you know, without knowing it's, it's, it's the name of the lake where they, they found the horn mine. Uh, but uh, we, we just ignored all the conventional wisdom as to what you could and couldn't, couldn't do. Uh, we did everything very well. Uh, I, I think we redefined uh, how you, you, you deal with things like moving a town, uh, your relationship with, with communities. We're, we're trying to be on the forefront of everything and, and, and be as socially responsible uh, and as sustainable as we can. Uh, but you know, really, it, it, it's a business about people. Uh, the mining business in Canada is, is about potential. It's a huge country. Uh, I think there's a, a huge potential to find lots of new mines, but, but it will take lots of entrepreneurial thinking. Uh, and uh, don't ever let anybody tell you what you can't do, because I, I think amongst all we've proven to a lot of people that there are lots of things that, you know, we, we went through a whole corporate history to date with people telling us what we couldn't do. And then we just kind of turned around and we went out and found big deposits and raised the money to build them, built them and they worked. And, uh, and what are you proudest of in life? Not just related to your career. I, the but proudest in life of not, uh, uh, not being a doctor. <laughs> That's a very good answer. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, it's, it's one of the decisions that, that I, uh, I have absolutely no regrets about uh, making. It's, uh, uh, it, it, it's a very interesting business to be in. Uh, you, you get to see all corners of the world if you want to, but you know, particularly all corners of the country. Uh, and it's uh, it's a fascinating new business to be in. And it's wealth creation at at its uh, uh, you know rawest uh, form. And you know we we've over the years employed hundreds if not thousands of people. And uh, you know seeing that that new wealth creation uh, not only for shareholders but for those individuals working within the group and reinvigorated small towns and and uh, you know, added to the to the wealth of the country. Uh, that, that's been the most exciting and important part for me. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to add? I think we're just starting. You know, we're 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 we're, we're obviously fairly well known as a company right now, uh, but I think we're just on the the beginning leg of, of ultimately what we hope to achieve here. Uh, you know, we're, we're, our ultimate end goal is to create one of these great Canadian mining houses that, that, that has a sustainable and, and long life like the Narandas and Falcon Bridges and Incos and Kamenkos have passed. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your time.